What is going on everybody? Hope you're doing freakishly awesome and in this video I want to share some of the things I've learned and do a paper explained of the most important ideas of GPT-1. So this paper is quite old uh, which in the machine learning deep learning world means uh, three years old uh, and but but still it's one of the most influential papers of NLP and sort of made a big big, uh, big breakthrough in natural language processing. And uh, it's been succeeded since GPT-1 by GPT-2 and GPT-3. Uh, but it's important to go back to sort of the foundation and what it actually was about. All right, so first of all, it's built on the transformer architecture. And so this is what it looks like. Um, I'm sort of assuming you are familiar with transformers, uh, but it, it basically takes the decoder uh, part of the transformer architecture and it just adds them uh, on top of each other. And specifically, they add 12 decoders on top of each other. And so, if we sort of look at what were the uh, the key ideas of GPT, so the first was to take the transform architecture, right? Previously, they used LSTMs and things like that. Uh, but now, you know, with this new architecture, they can just stack um, basically uh, decoders or encoders in the case of of BERT um, on top of each other. And then the second idea is uh, semi-supervised pre-training uh, really helps a lot. And then, and we'll talk more about that. And then thirdly, it is that we can take this pre-trained network and fine tune it on several uh, different tasks and it will perform really, really well. Um, so yeah, we, we, we already talked about the first point, which is that we just stack a bunch of them on top of each other. So the pre-training step is that you know we we take um, we take you know this GPT model right that's just a stack of these decoder of the transform architecture, and then we basically just throw a bunch of books at it and ask it to learn from those books, and that's the sort of the pre-training. But um, and you know if we do that, so if we just throw a bunch of books at at uh, GPT. It, res uh, it turns out that it actually works really, really well. But perhaps, you know, we should take a step back and actually understand how this works. So, all right, so, you know, more formally, what we want to do is uh, given uh, some previous words, all right, so let these uh, U here represent some previous words. We want to uh, maximize the probability of what the next word should be given the uh, some context of previous words. And then uh, given this parameter theta here, which is the model parameters. So we want to maximize the next predicted word given the a sequence of word previous uh, with respect to the model parameters. And then uh, K here represents sort of a context, um, uh, sort of a context, how many, how many words we have in context. So if we throw a book at it, maybe we just have it have like the previous 500 words or the previous 100 words. Um, instead of, you know, the, the entire maybe 500,000 or whatever. All right, so let me give an example to make this clear. Uh, an example would be uh, Lord Voldemort is coming for Harry, and then you're asked to predict the next, uh, so Harry Potter. And then uh, this is, you know, perhaps, you, you know, some, some context here as well would be, you know, uh, uh, sort of... Uh, yeah, in this case, I guess the context is one, two, three, four, five, six words. Um, so that's the pre-training. Um, it's pretty straightforward in a way, right? And it also turns out that uh, this sort of this pre-training uh, really, really helps a lot. And it helps with the generalization. Here they have taken the pre-trained network, right, on this uh, on the uh, book data set, and basically uh, they they see, well, if we transfer um, different amounts of layers, how well does it generalize to this new task? So what they see is that they, if they transfer more of the layers, right, take more of these pre-trained ones, then it performs better on this new task. Um, and so why this is um, possible, to, you know, how it's even possible to get this graph right here is that it's very, it's very computational expensive to do this pre-training, right? So they pre-trained it on a lot of these books um, for about one month on eight GPUs. 
But then uh, we have this supervised data set uh, that we can just fine tune it a little bit at the end. And so this fine tuning is pretty quick and that's you know how they can actually do get this kind of a figure even. Uh, but anyways, this you know this means that pre-training is good. It helps with the generalization accuracy on other tasks. But another interesting idea is that uh, what they were able to see is that if we just fine tune it on this uh, on these books and then see what the accuracy is on different kinds of tasks uh, like sentiment analysis um, or question answering systems and so on we can see that as we pre-train it on these books then it increases on these on these other tasks without it actually having you know seen any of that data at all and that's really interesting um, so that means, and they talk about that in the paper, saying that basically these language models seem to be um, zero-shot learners, meaning that it generalizes to new tasks without being trained on them. Now, obviously, we're not talking state-of-the-art performance here, but uh, nonetheless, it's an interesting idea. And if we look at GPT-2, for example, the title of that paper is, uh, if I remember correctly, something like uh, language models are multitask um, zero shot learners. So it seems that I haven't read that paper, but it seems that this idea of being zero shot learners is a big idea and is something that they build on in future papers. Um, but yeah, I'll probably do a review on that. So we'll see if I was, um, you know, what exactly it is about. Um, all right. So then the last thing, um, so, you know, right now we've seen how they built the GPT-1 model which is a stack of decoders. Uh, we've seen that pre-training made a huge difference. And then the third key idea was to then take this pre-trained network and fine tune it on these multiple different tasks. And so they got state-of-the-art performance of multiple of these tasks. Uh, this, you know, GPT-1 really did perform uh, exceptionally well on many tasks. So the question is, how do we get it to work on multiple tasks? Uh, if we look at classification, uh, so sentiment analysis, for example, the idea is that we take some, we have some star token, we add a text, and then we have some some final token um, that they call extract here, uh, and then we send it through the transformer, right? Our architecture, and then at the end we have this linear layer um, that is um, connected to the output of the final um, output from the transformer, right? So we have this mask, right? So we we send this might not be clear. Uh, maybe, but, but so the idea is that we we send it through this um, this transformer or GPT model, and then we just hook up a linear layer to the to the output of the transformer, the final output. And then uh, if we look at something like entailment, which is that we have basically two sentences, and we're asked to see if these sentences basically say the same thing. Uh, then we just do a start token. We have what they call the premise, sentence one. They have a, a separator, uh, and then they have a hypothesis, sentence two, and then finally a, an extract token. I'm not really sure why they call it extract and things like that, but uh, yeah, and then they send it through the transformer and then finally hook that up to a linear layer as well, and then output, you know, do these sentences say the same thing? Uh, also, pretty much if we have a similarity between two different texts, um, so do they describe the same thing? Uh, then we have text one, text two, and it seems that they also, um, they switch the ordering. So they have text two and text one. They send each of them through a transformer. They concatenate them and then they um, put that in a linear layer and finally a prediction. If we have multiple choice, uh, we have multiple different answers uh, given a context. Uh, then uh, you... Uh, basically, you run each of them through a transformer and through a linear layer, and then you get a you know a probability of how good this answer is to this uh, this context. Um, then, y at the end, you take the one that has the highest probability. Um, so those are how they summarized um, how you can then fine tune this you know huge network, or I guess it's relative, but 
maybe today is not that huge, but at, at that point it was pretty big network. So you pre-train this network and then you fine tune it at the end on this supervised data set and then you can structure it uh, as shown here. All right, so that's it for the GPT-1 model. Hopefully you under, hopefully this was insightful to get some understanding of, of uh, how it worked and the, the general key ideas. Uh, there are always details, of course. Um, I do think this should be pretty straightforward to implement, but that's always the idea before you get started. Uh, and yeah, I might do an implementation video. We'll see. But anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.